All right, welcome back, everybody. Episode two of the 14-week Learn UX course, and today is our Sprint One kickoff. It's going to be a big day. This is where the students get exposed for the first time to the problem, to the course, to the schedule, to everything that we're going to be doing. Uh, this will be the first time I've met with them. And basically what we've got for you to experience today is I'll be simulating clients going through a one-hour presentation via Zoom where I'm going to present as a startup the problem that I'm bringing to this UX team to help us solve and, and flush out using different research methods uh, that we'll go through throughout the course. So uh, it should be pretty interesting. It's going to be a, a pretty well simulated kind of client kickoff, which is usually how most of our engagements start as a UX professional. Um, in this today's episode, there's going to be three words that I want you to kind of know that the students have already been exposed to in my class, but I want to make sure you guys are familiar with them. So the first one's going to be generative research, and we're going to have evaluative research. Those are basically different research methodologies, and I can create a whole video and go into those in depth, but for the purpose of kind of today's course, just know that generative research is going to be before there's an actual product there's nothing to test whether it's a mobile app a website a physical device it doesn't exist yet right we're still an early startup trying to understand what our what our product should be what the features should have so during generative research the ux team stays very high level as they conduct their research and really just tries to understand the overall problem space and how users are doing things today and how we could benefit or introduce a product to market that would help benefit uh, some type of gap that exists and then on the other hand we have evaluative research like i mentioned and evaluative research typically comes later when there already is some idea of a product there's something tangible whether again it's a mobile app a website or a physical device that we can go off and test so that's evaluative think of also as more traditionally usability testing so when we have people just come in and do tasks to see if they can complete the most common scenarios using our device. As we're generative again, high level, before we have a product, just trying to understand how people complete the task today to try and understand what features our device could bring to market to really sort of fill a gap. And then the other thing is problem space. Problem space is a big issue uh, that we have in UX, and it's something that you're going to note in a couple of these videos that I try and keep the problem space as, as broad as possible right a lot of times a client will come to a UX team and say we know that we have a problem with X go off and figure out why we have that problem All right so now the UX team has been boxed in to X right they're not allowed necessarily to go off and see what some of the other reasons are that maybe this company's having problems so in that scenario it usually turns out okay for the UX professional but you're you're really limited by how, however correct the client was initially with what that box is. There may actually be a lot of outside factors that are influencing the success of that product that the client's not aware of. And if they don't give you the, the space as a UX professional to go off and capture those and explore those, then you're only going to be able to be as good as the, the problem space that's been set forth. So you'll notice a lot in these next two videos that I'm really trying to stay broad here, right? And to the point where students get a little bit annoyed. There's not a lot of structure. There's not a lot of sharp focus, right? And it gets a little ambiguous and abstract, but that's all part of it, right? It's part of us trying to start as broad as we can, and then we'll start to hone in. We'll go over stuff like the double diamond later in this series as well, but keep that in mind. So generative research, evaluative research, Check out uh, links below. I'll put some some just easy reading material in there for you to kind of go over those topics and then also problem space. Cool. So that's it. Let's go ahead and get into it. All right, sweet. Let's get started so we can get out of here, as always. <laughs> I like quick it. In, quick in, quick out. We got everybody. All right. So yeah, we've got this HCI projects course, which basically I just stood up uh, because, I mean, honestly, because of all the Corona stuff, we had so many students get their internships pulled and we're asking for just side projects and stuff that instead of having 20 individual projects I had to manage, it'd be better to just kind of us all team up <laughs> and knock out one project was kind of the goal. So that's kind of the, the whole driving force behind everything that's going on here. Um, I guess the other thing to kind of point out just right off the bat is that we're teaming up with Centir. Um, Centir's got kind of more of a research and dev arm or branch to it called Centir Labs. And 
the goal for Centere Labs is to kind of provide a fun place for the employees of Centere to kind of do side projects and stuff outside of client client work. So we meet uh, every other week um, for the Centere Labs projects. The team comes together. We've got eight or so people that meet every other week, and it's probably you'll see us over like. Christmas or January, I think, um, when we started just brainstorming kind of application ideas that we could could do to just start building like an app or something. So this is all kind of pre-COVID stuff. And one of the app ideas we had is, I won't talk about it too much, but we discussed it uh, in, in that lab. And since then, of course, client work has ramped up and we haven't had any time to actually do it. <laughs> so when I was trying to pull a project, um, that's kind of where this this project idea came from was us brainstorming. We had 10 or so different ideas we'd come up with. Um, this one seemed best suited for the class. So I'm not taking it because it was our best idea or anything like that. It just, it seemed very early stages and like generative where it wasn't like one of our ideas was, you know, work on a Zoom plugin that adds some additional functionality and stuff. So it was very specific. This one is very broad, as you'll hear here in a second. Um, so we'll go over that. All I've got really today is we'll we'll just introduce ourselves. We'll go through the the, the idea that we had, and then just kind of what the outline is for the course, and then we'll kind of kick off sprint one, so that we can start knocking that off. Uh, so let's see. Let me hop to the next slide here. So yeah. So we're talking about. Also got a little bit of problem space stuff, but we'll get to that in a second. So introduction wise, I guess we can just we don't have we've got a ton of people, so we don't have to spend a ton of time. So we can kind of just. I'll stop sharing real quick. We can all just pop around here and, and go. So maybe we'll start uh, Centura side, maybe? Like Kelly, you wanna go first? Yeah. My name is Kelly Terry. I'm the managing partner of Centure, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to just uh, watching what everyone can come up with. Thank you for your initiative and, uh, and interest in, in doing something like this. Cool, and Tom. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Thornton. I'm a partner at Centir. Uh, just quickly, my background's in um, cognitive psychology and mathematical psychology. Uh, I do a lot of quant stuff at Centir, but also a lot of UX research. Back in the day before we had a stellar design arm, I used to do some UI work, UX design, but I am not a UX designer. I'm mainly here for mentoring. If you guys have any questions about research or anything like that, I'm here to help. Cool. All right, let's see, Miss Jen Gao. Hi everyone, this is Jen. Uh, I am a lead researcher at Centier. I'm actually uh, just graduated um, from iSchool last year. I got my PhD. Uh, so it's really excited to work with you all. I'm looking forward to it. All right, let's see. Miss Christina Rodriguez, or not Rodriguez anymore. Christina. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Christina. I'm a lead designer here at Centir. Uh, my background is in communication design and uh, UX UI, learning a bunch of research. I'm also here for uh, mentoring, you know, kind of getting you guys through the course, excited to see what comes out of it. So yeah, nice to meet everyone. All right, and Ryan. Hello everyone, Ryan Holm, same as Christina, uh, lead product designer here. Um, Excited to start this project with you guys, but if you have you know any questions regarding UX or UI work, uh, I'm I'm always here. All right, and Jamie. Good morning, everybody. This is Jamie Nordquist, and I am the operations manager at Centir. And I'm joining uh, some of these calls just to see how Eric teaches his classes and to see if there's anything. I need to do in the background for anybody. So looking forward to seeing how everything goes. Yes, yeah, she's here to judge me. That's her job. Yeah. <laughs> I keep you on track, man. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, let's see. On the UT side, I guess um maybe it would be good for you guys just you know, quick, of course, intro, any background, you know, job experience you have or anything, but then maybe if you're kind of leaning more research or design, so we can just go that way. So I'll start at the top of my list here at Zoom with uh, Island. Hi, everyone. My name is Island. Um, my background is in nonprofits and education, and I'm interested in both UX research and design. I can't make my mind up. <laughs> perfect. Perfect, perfect. And are you? Uh, hi, y'all. Um, I'm Ayu, and I am kind of double dipping that I'm 
working for Sintir right now. Um, I'm also a UT student. Um, a little bit of both research and designer. I'm mostly here to kind of just observe. So I'm kind of working on the Sintir side of things right now. So I'm not really participating in the class. But yeah, nice to meet you. All right, and Ms. Beth Sarno. Hello. Um, I have a background in um, psychology and nonprofit work. Um, I worked at U UT Libraries for two years, and I'm focusing on research, UX wow. research. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. And Chloe. Hey, I'm Chloe. Um, I have a background in psych research and photo and video, um, and I think I'm leaning a little more into design. Perfect. I have this background and I'm going to lean on it. None. <laughs> all right, Han. That makes her a good fit, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. what we all. Yeah, I have this background. It bores me, so I'm going to try something else because I want to be challenged. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, Han. I think you're muted, Han. Skip Han. Right. Glad to have you, Han. I'll answer for him. He's a stellar, another one of Eric's stellar students. Uh, Hassan? Oh, okay, sorry. Oh. Hi, everyone. I'm okay. Han. Um, I'm a graduate student in advertising, and I took many courses in high school, and I think I'm sort of leaning in design a little more, and I'm very excited to work with you guys. Thanks. That's true. I forgot that you weren't actually in the high school. Yeah, so advertising. advertising. That's cool. Yep. That's cool. All right, Hassan. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hassan, and I am a student at high school. I have a background in architecture design and worked in architecture field for more than six years. And right now, I finished my first year at high school. I'm mostly inclined toward design aspect of UX, but I really like the research part to get inside from only. Oh, yeah. thanks. Hey, Hazam, can I ask a quick question? Did you do like architectural studies undergrad or something like that or what was yes, your? Yes, I really, yeah, I really like yeah, that. I know that degree, it's a good degree, cool. Yeah, thank you. All right, Zha Jin. So this is Zha Jin. Um, I just graduated a few days ago um, and I have a background in nutrition I study UX research and design. I kind of jump back and forth a little bit on two sides, and but now I probably lean more on design. Cool. Yeah, Eric, Jean can I ask a question? Was Zha uh, Jin, was your, uh, is it undergrad, master's? What was your, you just graduated with what? Um, I just graduated as master. Yeah. She had, she had a Thank job you. lined up after graduation and then COVID hit, so it got pulled. Actually, hers was more oil related than COVID, so. Yeah, oil, that yeah, that's a real drag. Yeah, so I wanted to keep her just active going and everything, so yeah, she agreed to join. She does awesome stuff. She keeps yep. going back and forth between research and design, but she's good at both, so it's, it's a good thing to go back and forth on. And let's see, Meg. Hi. I'm Meg Patton. Um, my background is in graphic design um, in my undergrad, um, and then I've done some UX UI work um, for the past three years, and uh, went, went back to get my master's and focusing on learning more about research um, and interaction design. Uh, do a little bit of both as well. Perfect, perfect. More like enterprise stuff, I'd say, right, Meg? Kind of your specialty right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I worked at USA, which was some consumer, but then some did some like employee kind of design too, some more yeah. um, enterprise stuff. And then I'm at Dell now doing um, enterprise. Cool. All right, hey, and, Eric. Yeah, Eric. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Are all these yeah. students people that you've taught previously, or do you have you come in contact with them in some other way? No. Yeah, I know everybody uh, except Rosa. Rosa's a wild card. Other than Rosa, yeah, I've worked with her, but at least, <laughs> at least two courses. <laughs> uh, usually, that's um, cool. Usually okay, taking the usability class, and most of them taking a the design class as well. So it's it's two courses. I've had with both of them or all of them. Well, it's great diversity. So Rose yeah. is on uh, the call too. Yeah, Rosa, uh, you can go ahead next. Yeah, she actually is just entering the program, I believe, right, Rosa? 
Hey everyone, I'm Rosa and I have a background in architecture design with years of uh, experience in designing and I'm incoming a student at the UTL Sinai School and I have a more lean in design as well. Yes. And thank you for this great opportunity. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, just for everybody's background. Yeah, so Rosa uh, was applying. She got accepted. During that process, uh, she was just asking for, you know, any kind of side work, side projects. I've seen some of her COVID stuff that she did, some concept work around COVID for UIs and all, and her stuff just looked really good. Plus, she's dying to get experience. So just like everybody else in the class, I'm a sucker for people that actually want to do work. So I'm always willing to. <laughs> So she absolutely wants to, <laughs> wants, to, wants to put in work and effort to get some experience. So that's why she's here as well. So thanks for being here. And last is Shravya. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shravya. Uh, so I'm still kind of deciding between research and design, but I'm thinking I'm leaning towards design more right now. Cool. And your background is, what is it? Engineering. Yeah, my background is okay. in engineering. Cool. All right. Kind of engineering. I did electronics and communication engineering. Oh. So, yeah. Very cool. Always curious. Thanks. All right, sweet. So that's the crew. So I will start diving back into this deck again. We're done with introductions. So kind of topic presentation now. Um, just to give you some background, kind of more inspiration, I guess. You may remember this whole phenomenon that happened way back in the day called Pay It Forward. Uh, Starbucks was the biggest, I think, kind of PR recipient of this this activity that was going on where, um, well, basically, you know, as, as it states, an expression for when a recipient of an act of kindness does something kind for someone else rather than simply accepting or repaying the original good deed. So if something good happens to you, you don't just say thanks and take it. You instead take whatever that good thing was and give it to somebody else to kind of keep the whole uh, good goodwill giving going, I guess. So it was a big craze back in 2013, 2014. Starbucks, as you can see, made headlines on CNN and every local news pretty much because people were going through the Starbucks lines and just doing this pay it forward thing. Um, so the, the gist of it, right, if you, if you don't remember it or weren't familiar with it and weren't in the country when it was going on here, I'll call the first person person zero, even though it's not really like a disease situation, but the, the, the initial person goes into Starbucks, we'll say at the situation, maybe they go through the drive through and they order a, whatever, a latte. They pay for their latte. And then they also, while they're paying for their latte, tell the, the person, the cashier, that I'll pay for the person's drink behind me as well. So that first person is actually paid for two drinks. So then person one, the one that now comes up to, to pay for their drink, gets told, hey, you don't need to pay. The person before you already paid for your drink. So then that person in the pay it forward game doesn't just say, okay, thanks and drive off. They say, oh, well then I'll go ahead and pay for the person behind me, right? And this chain of events continues where everybody is really just paying for the person behind them, paying for the person behind them, paying for the person behind them. Um, so this would go on 750 times, right? hundred times. I remember it happening to me at Starbucks the first time and I didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't understand. I thought I was going to have to owe somebody something. I wasn't quite sure. Um, but basically, if you think about it from like an economic standpoint, it's really a little bit of a uh, smoke and mirrors kind of a thing, right? Because really only person zero paid for two things. Everybody else, just instead of paying for their drink, paid for somebody else's drink, but they're still paying for a drink. Right, so all those 749 people in between didn't really give anything extra nor receive anything extra because they still bought a drink. It just wasn't technically their drink they were buying. They were buying somebody behind them. So really only that person at the very beginning who paid for two and the person at the very end who breaks the chain who says, okay, thanks, and takes their free drink and drives off without saying, I'll pay for the person behind me, only those two people really – benefit from like a financial standpoint when we actually think of of you know giving or charity as like a financial recouping of dollars so the interesting thing though to keep in mind i think with this whole idea is that the psychological feeling of giving and of being generous still occurred right because you were paying for somebody else's drink even though at the end of the day, economically, there wasn't really much of an advantage or disadvantage to you. You showed up at Starbucks to buy a drink and you did. You left buying a drink. Um, but because of the way the game honestly was set up, you left feeling as if you had done a good deed that day. 
So that's kind of one inspirational thing I wanted to just kind of throw out there before we kind of talk about, well, I mean, it's all kind of the topic we're talking about here today. And then the other thing that's kind of come up a lot lately is uh, Patreon. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this site. Um, Patreon basically was started, I think the story goes, same time frame, I think 2013, 2014, by an artist um, as a way for fans to pay for the, the artist's creations directly. So basically as the music industry was was tanking, right, because people were bootlegging MP3s or just you know buying songs individually, artists of course weren't making what they were used to be making so they basically set up this site if you're not familiar with patreon at all it's basically you as a as a youtuber as a podcaster as a photographer as a videographer as an artist as a musician you can almost think of it like a kickstarter type thing where people are paying for your stuff and the money goes directly to you via patreon and they have it set up to where people can choose to pay you by song um, if you're a, if you're a YouTuber, they can pay you by episode, right? They can say, I'm going to pay, I pledge almost, you know, $10 per episode. And then that incents the YouTuber to the vlogger to be putting out more YouTube vlogs because they have this, this fan base that's already agreed to pay per, per vlog that comes out. Um, so it's an interesting idea that's actually taking off quite well, right? So I'm bringing it up also because it's a different play on kind of generosity or charity or giving. Um, so the business model, again, like I said, behind Patreon is basically they stand up this thing. Um, they charge the creators 10% of the revenues. So basically they've got a 5% platform fee and a 5% payment processing fee. But other than that 10%, right, the 90% goes to the, to the actual artist or the creator that's putting out stuff. But the interesting thing to me is we're just kind of doing, you know, secondary research here, looking at market size or whatnot. Patreon has announced that it's processed more than $500 million in payments in 2019. Right, and creator-wise, they have at, creators with at least one Patreon or Patreon down here at the bottom. There's 132,000 creators currently on the site. And then this is the interesting part as well, right? So the actual patrons, the people that are doing the giving or the, the funding, there's more than 3 million active patrons, where it's 50% year-over-year increase. So if we put these two things together, right, this pay-it-forward idea and kind of this Patreon model idea, there's a a different kind of way that people are, are wanting to, to give their money, right? Versus just a traditional, you know, the big kind of, you know, goodwills and Salvation Armies and, you know, whatever organization that you believe in and want to donate to. It's a, a big company or organization, nonprofit doing things. This is a way more small targeted kind of venture where people are still getting a lot of the same feelings of, of charity or giving uh, without look, going to those large entities. The pay it forward one, interesting in that it's strangers, right? So it's really more of a, I wonder if we even still call it charity, right? Or, or philanthropic efforts, or is it really just being nice to, to a fellow human, you know, when you're just buying the person's drink behind you kind of a thing um, versus, of course, Patreon also has hints of that, but it's not a stranger. It's kind of a cause that you believe in, but not a cause as we've kind of typically thought of nonprofit organizations, right? This is more of a, of a cause where I see an individual that I like what they're doing and I want to show them that I support what they're doing directly. And then I also saw a lot of this during um, COVID. Right. Whenever people were going into restaurants and wanting to leave, you know, large tips and stuff. Right. Even though it was just, you know, either they wanted credit or they just wanted it to be anonymous or even just somebody in your apartment complex. Right. You know that there's an individual who's not able to go to work anymore because of COVID and you just wanted to, you know, drop 50 bucks off at their doorstep or something. You know, there's there's all kinds of those types of things that went on that didn't make a lot of, of course, you know, public attention because the person doing it didn't want it to be public. But at the same time, it's it's a, it's a direct act of, I want to support this individual. And we don't really have a way of, of facilitating that today. So one thing I was pulling up, just again, real quick, this isn't full you know, secondary research or anything, but I just wanna get you guys ideas on what's going on here. The Guardian had put out something um, a while back on just kind of giving and research. And the first underline there, researchers have looked into why people donate. Uh, why they don't do it as much as they would hope to and how to bridge this gap, right? So people want to donate. They don't do it as much as they want to, which to me kind of shows that there's a, an opportunity to provide 
ways for them to donate either automatically or easier. I don't think it's really an easy thing. I think people just get too busy and then they, you know, the year goes by and you say, I forgot to donate at all. The other thing they talk about here is it's often we struggle to make donations as often as we think we should. So again, kind of building on that whole, how can we simplify that? Um, this individual, this is from a university that the Guardian Post, they've got a whole PDF here about research that they've, they've gone through and done. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting was uh, it was found that people are much more responsive to charitable pleas that feature a single identifiable beneficiary. <clears throat> right, so I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the pay it forward or the Patreon, right? It's a specific individual or even the, 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 the citation from you know, COVID when you're just helping out, you know, a, a stranger basically or someone you at least know in your apartment and maybe you're not friends or anything with them, but you just want to help them out some. It's a targeted individual, right, that you've gone after um, versus giving money to an organization and then, you know, you somewhat hoping it goes to where you think it's going to go and then doing their best to try and show you where it is going, but it's just not as direct um, as what they showed here from the research that people are more responsive to. So just trying to paint all that picture and it's very uh, vague and abstract on purpose, right? Because what I'm trying to do here is, is build you guys a, a problem space without boxing you in. Um, so that's why I chose this project again, because it's not a, a Zoom plugin where we already know we're in a box that now needs to look like Zoom, work like Zoom, function in a Zoom paradigm. This, we have no kind of walls built for you, right? We have no idea if this should be mobile app, web app, anything else we can think of, right? There's there's no clue um, as, as to what's going on. So all I'm trying to do with these three slides here with this research, with the, the Patreon stuff and with the pay it forward is just kind of give some inspiration onto what the, basically the rip we were having in Centur Labs that day when we were just trying to talk about, you know, some ideas around stuff. So we had a little bit more specific details that we went into, but I almost don't want to go into those with you guys. I, I'd almost rather you guys just have the ability to come up with your own versus me giving you anything else to box you in really. So I kind of just put this forward, right? As far as what we believe and it's kind of for you guys to, to go off and do research on, right? To kind of challenge this hypothesis. Um, you know, if we think there's anything to this at the end of the research, what is it and how can we go there? So, Basically, you know, we believe, I guess, from the, the quick stuff conversations we had and some of the early research we did that people want to give, right? It helps them feel good. There's all kinds of psychological benefits that we'll be able to find with our research phase as far as, you know, the, the value that people get. Um, it also helps with a sense of community, right, which I think is really big right now and, and a reason that I also wanted to build something in this space is that, you know, in a time when we're all being, you know, more and more divided for multiple reasons, anything that we can do to remind each other that we're all still one community, despite whatever differences you think you have, is always going to be a positive thing. Um, I think the pay it forward also shows that people want to give to random strangers. Um, sometimes, you know, not strangers, not random strangers, people doing things that they support, right? We've already cited stuff like people in your apartment complex, the the, the waiter or waitress at the restaurant you used to go to that now is closed because of COVID, you know, how could you give money to that individual? You can't find them anymore, track them down. People also want to give more frequently, right? I think if you go back to the research that was done, man, that was probably 10 or 12 years ago. There's a lot of stuff going on in the micro lending space, right? That was a, a right. big thing that was going on where, uh, you know, it's kind of more like third world countries and stuff where, you know, as a, as a rice farmer there, you couldn't get started without a shovel, right? So these micro loans of just giving people a few dollars to buy a tool so that they could start, you know, the rice business or something like that. So it's, I think there's also something to this idea of frequently giving uh, small amounts just to kind of help with that feeling of positivity and community support and giving, right? This doesn't have to be the, the Patreon where I sign up for $25 once a month. This could be, you know, can I give, you know, a quarter randomly every day to somebody, you know, and if everybody does that, it could actually, that person could get a hundred dollars for the day, you know, but for all of us, it only Eric, takes that, a day. Yeah. That's super interesting. I was just going to say, just a riff for a second there. It, it's, it, I think, 
it'd be fun for the team to research too, sort of whether or not that kind of more small giving is super additive in the sense that, you know, you could give one time, give 10 bucks or 10 times you could give one buck. Right. And I bet you get more than 10 times the, yeah, the benefit or the good the feeling, value. whatever yeah, it yeah. is. But anyway, there's some interesting stuff there. That's cool. Yeah. And then just real quick, I've also got just the, you know, what we, what I don't think, right. It's again, just kind of our hypotheses. What I don't believe people want to do is have to remember to give, I think this could be something that almost gets uh, almost like based on interest gets set up and gets automatically done and you almost get notified about it. And then you can choose to continue with whatever was automatically done or tweak the parameters of it some or stop it all together. Um, but I think that's a, a main blocker for all of us. I think we all feel that personally, right? We've, we, we don't mind helping. We just don't know you know, we don't have time, honestly, to do it. It doesn't cross our mind on a daily basis. And I also don't think people want to spend a ton of time researching how the money's spent. I think that's kind of one of the blockers. Some of the research that I read earlier, you know, discussed that that was one, one blocker for giving to large organizations is they have to kind of chase down where that money's going to go, right? We've all heard the stories and whether they're true or not, I don't know. I haven't done any of the research, but if, you know, after Katrina, the Red Cross comes and the Red Cross gets all of this money and then it comes out, well, that money didn't go to people for Katrina, which at the end of the day, does it really matter? I mean, you're giving to a, an organization that you think is making change. So why are we now then expecting to micromanage them? But it does kind of hint that there is a sense of I gave for this specific thing right and I thought it was going to go to these specific people um, so I think that's why something that we would you know design for would help kind of take all of these things into account where it's not that I have to go research it because I'm giving it to that specific individual right and I really clearly know what it's going towards and maybe I can even track progress of the effect that my giving gave or something like that so those are just some kind of real quick things, but again, uh, it's very vague and it's meant to be vague on purpose so that we have uh, a few weeks of kind of generative research built into the, the sprints that we have going on. So high level, before we go into the individual sprints, this is kind of the structure of the course. We've got seven sprints. I think we go from this week until the last week of August, pretty much. Uh, our sprints will be two weeks. So Monday through Friday, and then Monday through Friday. Uh, every Monday, you have on your calendar invite a kickoff for that sprint, except this week. This week, we're doing it today on a Tuesday because we have Memorial Day. Um, then you will have that entire week to go off and work on the sprint. Uh, we will have a check-in that following Monday. So just any questions, any just kind of how's everybody doing, status update, you know, quick meeting there. And then every other Friday, so every second week, because the sprint ends uh, two weeks at that second Friday, there'll be a presentation of what was supposed to be done during that sprint. Um, so we'll kind of work on some specifics and stuff as we get closer to that presentation, but just more, more formalized, more honestly, more experience to what you're going to be doing in a corporate environment. So that was kind of my goal here as we structure this. Since so most of you are missing out on your internships for the summer, my goal is just kind of give you what you would have received there. So it's just set it up very, very industry-like so we can go ahead and plow through some things. Um, so let's see, from the Centier side, you've already heard from, I think we'll probably have Tom and Jen primarily be mentors for research, and Christina and Ryan will primarily be the uh, mentors on the uh, design side. I have set up, if I escape out of here, <clears throat> uh, multiple things. So the Centier team does not have this. So I was trying to just not block your your uh, days up too much with stuff. But if you want access, let me know. I don't know if it's really necessary. But basically, I've set up a Team Gantt that everybody on the call now has access to, all the students in the course, where I've set up uh, all seven of our sprints. So we can just kind of plow through that real quick to get everybody an idea of, of kind of what I've outlined for everything. Um, also, another thing for you guys to know, for the students to know, over here, I've got little comment bubbles, right? So I tried to drop in some small things, like as I was thinking of them and building them out, what some of the key goals would be for, for each of these phases. So just make sure you click on these comment bubbles as you're kind of reviewing stuff. But just kind of recap, we've got today, which is our Centure kickoff meeting. Um, roles, the roles are going to be a little tricky because, I mean, as we heard from the introductions, you know, we've got a, people who kind of do both research and design. Um, the way I've set it up, I've kind of divided us between researchers and designers. But I don't think that that, that divide needs to be 
uh, hardcore at all. I think, you know, everybody can kind of participate in whatever it is they want to participate in, but you'll just kind of see later as we get into the sprints. I mean, we honestly don't have a lot of time, right? Seven sprints is, is not a lot of time to go from generative research all the way to, to high fidelity mock-up. So the reason I've split people as researchers and designers is because I have parallel paths going, right? So we almost need to have everybody identify a little bit as research or design and, you know, try to get a, an equal mix on those if we can. Um, we'll get to that though. Slack channel, I've created our Slack channel. Uh, so we've got Slack going on here already. Again, I can invite the Centera team to that. That way, you know, you guys can ping them for, for mentor stuff. Um, channel wise, I've got a designer specific. So if we have any, you know, specific just to design questions, like as you guys are working through style guides and colors and, you know, fonts, icons, that type of stuff, you know, any kind of question for Christina or Ryan could go into the designer specific. I've got general. So this is where I'll be posting a lot of stuff around just schedules and timelines and, you know, checking in with everybody, how's everything going. And then we've got a research specific one down here as well. Um, you guys can always, of course, direct message, but you know, probably just so everybody can kind of stay in the loop of what's going on these three channels. Uh, the other reason I put Slack on here is I was trying to cut down on the number of times we actually have to meet uh, face to face, right? Or, or, through video conference just because it is summertime everybody has other stuff going on everybody on the satire side of course has full-time workload um, we've got some of the students who have jobs still as well so the the more we can just do stuff um, via slack uh, would be better for for everybody but of course you guys are free to to schedule meetings and meet you know throughout the week as you guys are working on your individual stuff as much as possible um, so we've got slack channel uh, Miro accounts I'll set that up for everybody as well I think a lot of you should have it already from the rapid prototyping class but I'll make a note now to just make sure I go through and add everybody to Miro today uh, you don't have to use Miro Miro has just worked out really nicely for us in the rapid prototyping class for those that aren't familiar with it, I'm like Zha Jin, I don't know if we had gone over it when you were there or not. Let me see if I can, oh goodness. Ugh, never mind, I'll do that later. But <laughs> Miro is basically just a online collaborative whiteboarding space that has some pretty cool uh, little things on it as well. So for a lot of our scenario creation, our ideation, right, basically from our sprint book, um, we'll do some of those activities and we can use Miro for all that. That way, again, we don't have to always meet in person for things or even meet remotely for things. Um, let's see, I also create a contact sheet. So my plan is to do that today. Um, everybody likes to be contacted in different ways. So what I'll do is I'll just create a Google sheet with everybody's name on it. And you guys can choose to put your phone number on it if you want to put your phone number on it. And then I'll have kind of a preference one and a preference two with preference one being, you know, how do you want to be contacted first? So do you want a text message? Do you want Slack? Do you want an email? Do you want a phone call? Right. And you can just kind of set that up for preference one and for preference two. Cause again, everybody likes something different, right? I, I prefer a text. I will always see a text before I'll see Slack or an email. Um, so we'll just kind of have everybody can have the option to go through and, and create that contact sheet. So I'll get that done today as well. And then also here, so for sprint one, the other big thing we need to kick off, you can see I started to divide up researchers into two and then designers as well. So for researchers, we need secondary research, right? I mean, I gave you just a very early kind of teaser of some of the stuff that I thought would be interesting going into something. Um, what I've got here is just, you know, psychology around why people donate, why they give, you know, philanthropy, et cetera. Also demographics, right? Like who, who does this? What's their, their age, gender, income, you know, et cetera. So we can just start to get as many data points as we, as we can about the individuals that we may be designing something for. Um, the other thing we need is, you know, again, I've got researchers here, market analysis, right? So how big a market is this? Right, how I've got some data for Patreon. Are there competitors to Patreon? How big is that market? How big is the the larger nonprofit market as well? Even though, of course, I don't think we're, you know, necessarily going after something like that, but it could be interesting to find out as well. Um, what are the primary things or ways that people are donating, giving, doing these types of things? Right, who's who's winning in this space? Who's leading in this space? Who's the new people in this space? And then again, same thing around age, gender, income, et cetera, as well. And then what I've got for the designers is some comparative analysis, right? So again, staying in, in contact with these two individuals, right? As we start to identify people and places, then we need some comparative analysis on all of this, right? So from a visual standpoint on the design side, 
how are they achieving this? Is this is this primarily website? Is this something that's mobile, right? Are people really wanting to give on the go from their car, or is this something that they actually want to sit down and do on a on a large display? Right, and how are we dealing with features, right? What are some interesting features people have? Are they wanting to, to share with others that they have donated? Is there a lot of social media built into this stuff? Or is this something that people want to do, you know, kind of privately and not let all their friends know they're doing? And also, what's the feedback uh, as far as wanting to talk to the individual that you give to, right? On these type of, of apps or things that you find, are there places where people leave comments? And, you know, can they track progress? And what's the features look like for all that? And how's all that being done? So working closely with kind of the market analysis team, right, as they kind of start to identify key players and the designers can go in and start just grabbing screenshots, right? You guys are on the design side are trying to build up as much collateral as you can to go into the design phase. So, you know, we're capturing login screens, we're capturing dashboards, we're capturing the, this is how they give screens, just screen by screen by screen of all the competition just so that we can start to sock it away kind of in our, our inspiration folder so that as you guys start to move to design, you've got a lot of stuff built up already. Um, I guess something else just to call out, of course, then we'll have our check-in next Monday and then our sprint presentation here, but a change from probably what we've done in the classroom versus what you'll do in the, the real world, right, or in industry, these sprint presentations are not formal. We don't need reports right they're like robust and look gorgeous so this isn't like your end of class projects in your in your courses at all right this the the real world is fast 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 where i'd much rather you have spent the extra five hours doing more secondary research than five hours prettying up the deck that you show us right we're not going to judge you for the deck you present every other friday we it's way more about the substance now the actual stuff you find so don't don't sweat at all you know what this what this presentation looks like it's it's more about the activities in here and everything of course is just going to build and build and build so again the key goal here is what what are the motivating factors behind this whole idea of, of giving right and who's in this space and how are they doing it today or kind of the the key goals we're looking for so sprint one i just got is understanding the landscape so then building on that, we'll hop down to sprint two. Well, sorry, I've got a straddle sprint here. And the reason I've done that, if I open both of these up, so here's our week one, our week two for sprint one, and then here's our week one and week two for sprint two. And we're going to always be blocked by recruiting, right? So we need to, as quickly as possible, start thinking about recruiting folks. So as soon as we start getting information about who the types of people are, what they're doing, how they're doing it today, all of that feeds into our screener so we can start recruiting. So recruiting is almost a out of sprint activity that we need to do so that we can just start to prep for actual doing interviews. Because right? that'll of course be our next phase is doing generative work with people who are doing this today to see how they're doing it. So for sprint two, I've got setting the foundation. Basically it's just our generative interviews. All right, so the researchers all come together. You guys can tag team however you want to as far as moderators, note takers, and start to just interview folks who have been using these tools that we identified during sprint one, right? And it's gonna be just very generative. It's not evaluative. We're not talking about the individual tools they're using. It's more of the, why do you give? You know, who do you give to? What are some, some opportunities that you wish you had that you don't have, right? Any pain points in their current system? How do you do it today? Walk me through the steps of how you do it. Are there any opportunities for improving that? Um, just some very early kind of ideation brainstorming sessions around this, this whole idea, depending on what we get out of Sprint 1. So we can't start thinking about our script really for Sprint 2 until we get some more data out of Sprint 1 to see kind of what's out there. And we'll talk about that in those Friday meetings as far as what we need to step off and go into. And then also, let's see again, so out of our, our Friday final presentation, one of the good things I think about presenting on a Friday and then having the weekend off is of course our brain needs time to, to build up the associations between all the things that we've heard, right? As it starts to come up with solutions. So this Friday presentation, we can mainly just listen to all the information that people have versus start solutioning right away. Cause it's probably going to be better for it to, to marinate over the weekend. And then whenever we have our sprint to kickoff, we can kind of start with, you know, what it was that we heard Friday and then we can go through and start actually figuring out what steps we want to do for the sprint two. Um, so that's the idea there. So basically sprint two, 
researchers are going to start creating the generative interview scripts. So you get two weeks to work on that script while recruiting is going. So honestly, recruiting can, can keep going all of this week as well. So I gave as much time for recruiting as I could. Um, designers, the thought was you guys start beginning building out a design system. All right, so coming out of sprint one, you're going to have ideas and we'll have discussions, of course, around, you know, what are people doing today? What features do they have? And we can just start doing some early, early groundwork. We're not really going to solidify is this mobile, is this desktop, because we won't have any data from users yet, right? So really at this phase, it's just, let's start playing around with some colors, some fonts. It's just all get into Figma and start getting stuff together. And then, of course, you guys are free to help out the researchers as well. Uh, sprint three, I've got our actual generative research. So then we've got two weeks of the researchers and designers all coming together and knocking out these interviews. All right, so once we recruit folks, then we just, researchers are creating their generative script here. Designers are pitching in, also starting to build out a design system. And then these two weeks are simply us doing the research. So again, you guys can pair up however you want to as far as note takers, moderators. Um, it's just gonna be probably Zoom sessions. Uh, we can figure all the logistics out as we get there. Um, but yeah, basically just start to actually do our generative research to feed into everything we're doing. And again, in a standard kind of corporate world, like this Friday is going to be way more like our sprint book, right? Where it's just a readout, right? Notes have to be taken as we go. And then the people after each session are kind of summarizing the findings so that on Friday, we almost just have a readout of the summary of the findings. All right, if you guys have time to then start doing some actual affinity diagramming, that'd be awesome. But uh, we don't need any kind of big formal presentation at all, right? We're just trying to understand what did we hear from Sprint 1 and what did we hear from Sprint 3 so that we can start moving on to actually, you know, more of a design thinking approach and figuring out what it is to do. So Sprint 4 is us developing our MVP feature set. So this is where we start working on, you know, early concepts. So again, just like our Sprint book, Researchers and designers, now that you've heard from Sprint 1 and from Sprint 3, we've got more data now. So now we start thinking about what is this thing we want to make to support the things we've now heard. Right, and we're just going to do pencil sketches, just early stuff, right? If you're, if you're already in Sketch or Figma, great. Otherwise, just pencil sketch stuff. And then we'll just do museum presentations. We'll throw everything into Miro, just like we do in the Sprint book. And everybody can go and just vote on things that they like. So we probably won't do presentations to avoid those that present well, getting their stuff uh, listened to more than others. So we'll probably end up just doing, everybody has their mock-ups early, early, just rough draft ideas of features and things that we think, you know, people be beneficial uh, receiving after what we've heard and then others can just kind of come and vote on those things all right and from those museum presentations when we start to see what the the key features are that people want then we'll start building out our scenarios all right so then we start to really we, again we go from a, a very convergent or sorry a very divergent point of view down to a convergent point of view where we're starting to really figure out now what are the key features that we think are the, the things we would need to launch for mvp so we'll develop our scenarios out and then those scenarios become the key things that we work on for the rest of the semester as far as delivering. So then you guys basically will wrap up sprint four with a presentation of, of the scenarios and basically the, hey, this is what it is we're gonna be building now at the end of sprint four. So kind of crazy of course, because we don't actually start building anything until more than halfway after the, the, the course, but that's actually the correct way to do it. As you all know, we should spend way more time actually figuring out what the needs are from our users versus just hopping in and designing something based on the four slides that I just showed you. So we won't talk too much about what it is we're even building here for, for a month and a half still. Then we'll hop into actually building out uh, the prototype. So once we have our scenarios defined, it'll be business as usual from the rapid prototyping class you guys have taken with me, right? Where we'll start creating mock-ups to fulfill those scenarios. Um, the research, or sorry, the designers will, the researchers will go off and start building out, uh, starting to recruit, but then also starting to develop the evaluative test packet, All right? Because now that you guys know what the scenarios are, you know what your tasks need to be for your usability scripts, because you know what your prototype's functionality is going to have in it, right? Because the designers are now marching towards what came out of Sprint 4, so you as researchers can start marching to that as well and start building out that feature set. So researchers will be recruiting and developing the evaluative script. Designers will be refining that design system. All right, now that we kind of have an idea of what it is we're doing, we can start fleshing out Figma more and more and more and starting to build the prototype to support those scenarios. So we'll be doing that on Sprint 5. Sprint 6, researchers and designers all come together again. 
and start doing the evaluative research. So basically testing the LoFi prototype that came out of Sprint 5. All right, so designers will kind of split up the scenarios, mock things up. It'll all be consistent because we'll already have been kind of working from a shared design system that started up in what, Sprint 2, I think it was, on the design side. So it should be easy for the designers to kind of split up, tackle a scenario each, and then we'll come together to have a full functional prototype with multiple scenarios in it that we'll then go off and test here in Sprint 6. So again, researchers in design come together. Researchers can be moderators. Designers can be note takers. And then the same type of process, we'll just be kind of taking notes and summarizing as we go so that by the end of these two weeks, you guys will present the findings from what you got. And then Sprint 7 is just going to be an iterate on the designs and high fidelities. So that's pretty much the flow. We started running out of time. Summer's quick. Of course, I always run out of time because I want to get you all as much experience as possible. I never have as much time as I'd like. So that's a quick rundown of what we're going to do from now until, what is it, August 21st. So yeah, one week prior to the end of August. Because I think classes didn't start for us 25th or something like that. So I started y'all early and took y'all late. But you wanted it, so I'm giving it to you. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So we can kind of stop there. We've got just, you know, 10 minutes, of course, left for Q&A stuff. Um, but basically just to recap, this first sprint, researchers and designers, you guys can all kind of split yourselves up in Slack. We just need people doing secondary research right around this whole idea of giving the psychological benefits, the effects, right? Things that people like about it, dislike about it. And then also just market analysis, who's doing this today. Um, we can decide how big or how small we want to go as far as, uh, you know, going after large nonprofits versus more of these kind of niche things, which right now I'm thinking that's probably what we should do, but we can discuss that as we go. And then designers starting to just do some competitive analysis. So for the next two weeks, that's kind of the goals. I'll get the Miro stuff set up so we can work in Miro as you want. And then also that contact list. So that as you need people, if you hit them up on Slack and they're not responding, you at least know that they said it was okay for you to, to email them and give them their email address or to text them and give them their phone number. So I'll get a contact sheet together for you as well. And then I'll also get the Centir team into Slack. I didn't do that. So let me get Centir into Slack so that you guys kind of have them to lean on as a resource as well as you have questions about things. Um, my job will primarily be project managing, but then I'll also be like probably the first stop when you have questions for things. But as you have resource questions that are beyond me, I'll pop you over to Tom and Jen. And same thing on the design side, I'll pop you over to Ryan and Christina. So, so yeah, that's all I got. What do y'all think? Is that way too vague or is that uh, all right for you? Because I didn't box you in too much. Anybody? It sounds exciting, Eric. All right, makes sense. Yeah. And like I said, we, we had more ideas around what a product could be, but I I don't want to I don't want to give you all that really because I think it'll bias you too much versus you guys coming up with your own ideas. But I think if you just kind of just kind of think about this idea of people wanting to give in order to have a sense of community and to help others and because of course it makes them feel good and wanting to do that in an easier manner what can we design to kind of fulfill fulfill that so let's we'll kind of see what comes from this whole thing all right yeah eric i like that you i like that you left a lot of the research open too and i think it's probably not a, maybe there's not a lot of research out there but it'll be a great opportunity yeah that's what i was think we don't have a whole bunch in the high school around generative research, you know, it's a lot more just projects where usually they're given a topic and it's just go tackle that topic now. So this is more of what I usually do in like advanced usability where it's more vague. I mean, it's honestly, this is honestly as you get more senior probably in industry and you've already kind of proven that you are a good researcher, 
then you'll start getting pulled up into the more strategic roadmap discussions of like where where is this going in the future versus you know as you first get put into industry it's going to be hey we've already decided on a product now i need you to go research to figure out how that product's successful you know versus this is more of the you know say uh i don't know say michael dell sitting down going how can machine learning help our company and it's just very vague right it's not a product even yet it's more of a just an idea of what is the technology how can the technology help us or be beneficial to our users and explore that out so that's kind of the thought here cool all right anything else anybody anybody all right cool so we can go ahead and just break we move stuff into slack everybody can start kind of self identifying i guess i'll probably just put that on the contact sheet as well as far as you know research or design or you guys can just kind of do it in slack there's only 10 or so of us you know in the actual course so it's it's not a hard thing for us all to just communicate in slack versus having to do a whole bunch of formal documentation or anything like that um so let's just break up I'll be here all week long as you guys have questions. And of course, next Monday we'll meet as well. So your team be optional on those check-ins. I mean, you guys can be optional on everything, of course. Um, and even students, you know, I know that's, some of you have got travel stuff going on. Some of you got jobs already. I'll record everything and post everything up. So uh, if you need to miss, you know, a meeting for a week or something like that, it's not a deal breaker at all. Don't sweat that. Um, it's actual real life and how it's going to be. So that's perfectly acceptable. Cool. Anything else? All right. Looking forward to working with all of you. Cool. I'll post this deck up into Slack so everybody has that, and then we can just let that marinate some and start getting a plan for breaking up into those three streams for the sprint. All right. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thank Later. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.